Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to uh, this evening's Parks at Home webinar. My name is Lindsay, and I'm a park interpreter in Birds Hill Provincial Park, located on Treaty 1 territory, homeland of the Anishinaabe and the Métis Nation, whose peoples are deeply connected with the animals and the plants of this land. Uh, tonight, we have a special guest joining us. Uh, this is Bill Watkins, uh, one of our biodiversity conservation zoologists. Uh, and he's going to be doing a presentation for us this evening on the elusive cougars, uh, which we get many questions of in Birds Hill and in other parts of Manitoba. Uh, before I turn it over to Bill, I just want to let everyone know that our presentation this evening is being recorded. All participants are in listen only mode, muted and cameras are disabled. Over the course of the webinar, please use the chat box for comments, or if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A on the Zoom window, and we will strive to answer as many questions as we can towards the end of the presentation. Uh, so without further ado, Bill, please take it away for us. Well, um, I wanna just check and make sure that everything's working um, so you can see my presentation, Lindsay. Yes, we can. All right. Well, thank you very much. I want to thank all of you for taking the time to be here this evening. Um, I don't think you'll be disappointed. It's very appropriate, actually, to be doing a presentation on Cougar right now because I've just finished compiling the statistics for 2020. And 2020 turned out to be a bit of a banner year in the sense that we had or were able to confirm five different cougar reports that came in. Over the course of the year, we had about 40 different reports that people had cited cougar uh, or, or the signs of cougar, like tracks and, and scratch marks and things like that. But we were only able to confirm five of them with physical evidence. Two, of course, were dead animals that were turned into the department back in February. And the other three were trail camera photographs that uh, people were kind enough to send in. So with that as a bit of a background, I wanna start by giving you a little bit of history and a little bit of uh, biology and ecology about cougar. And then we'll get right into the material related to the recolonization of cougar to Manitoba. So I'll start with a little bit on names because cougar are one of those species. Well, it's, it's actually a record book species. The Guinness World Book of Records lists the cougar as the animal with the most different common names of any species anywhere in the world. So here in North America, we're, uh, we call them cougar if you live in Manitoba or um, in Canada. If you're in the Western United States, they're referred to as mountain lion. If you're in the Southwestern United States, they're called puma. Uh, if you're in New England, they're called the catamount. And of course, in Florida, they call them the panther. Their scientific name in Latin is puma concolor. It used to be Felis, which is interesting because that's the same uh, genus name that house cats have. But it was changed 20 or so years ago to Puma uh, to reflect that they, they really are a little bit different than house cats. Concolor means one color. So essentially the scientific name means cat of one color. They're found through North America and down into South America all the way to the tip. Now this is the current range and a lot of people were quite surprised to find out that they actually live in tropical jungles in South America, but they live in a lot of other areas as well. Historically, they were found all the way across the continent of North America to the East Coast, hence the, the name catamount in the New England states. The early colonists encountered cougar in the uplands in those regions. But you can see in the sort of pale yellow color, uh, that runs across the continent, you'll notice that southern Manitoba was part of the historic range of mountain lion or puma or cougar, as we prefer to call them today. Now, cougars uh, are a, a sort of a medium-sized cat. They weigh anything from about 30 two to 105 kilograms. And I've, I've also got that in pounds for people who are more comfortable in, in thinking in pounds. Their height at the shoulder can be up to about 79 centimeters. Their body length can be up to 2.8 meters. Females a little bit smaller at 2.1 meters. And that is the 
tip of the nose to the tip of the tail. Now the tail is very, very long in cougar, almost the same length as the body itself. So half of that total length is made up of the tail. They're carnivores, which means they eat things like deer and elk and, and small mammals, and they tend to hunt from dusk to dawn. Now, if you only had a jawbone to look at, you could tell they were carnivores because of the special adaptation they have in their teeth. Where humans have premolars and molars, cougars have a kind of a tooth called a carnassial tooth. So rather than being flat for crushing and grinding the way our molars and premolars are, theirs are a little bit more like steak knives for cutting and slashing and tearing, which allows them, of course, to rip pieces of meat off of uh, their prey items that they have uh, successfully hunted. They're habitat generalists, and as I've just pointed out, they're found all through North America and South America, uh, in taiga, in temperate forest and rainforest, in grasslands, deserts, tropical savanna, and of course, mountains. They tend to breed at about two to three years for females and a little bit older for males, three plus years. Their pregnancy lasts for about 90 to 96 days. Now, like house cats, they are capable of breeding in any month of the year, and cougar litters have been recorded in every month of the year in North America, but there is a pulse of breeding in late spring and early summer, or, or of birthing when, when they give birth to their kittens. Now, they can have up to six, but that's highly unusual. The number of kittens in a litter is um, two to three on average. Now, I'll make a point here about what do we call baby cougar. And the way it kind of breaks out is that kittens or cubs are both acceptable. It depends what you refer to the animal in the area where you live. So where they're referred to as cougar, kittens, it, that's a completely appropriate name. But if you call them mountain lions, then cubs is more appropriate and uh, that's what people often refer to them as, but either is correct. So since they're called cougar in Manitoba, I'll be using the term kitten when I'm talking about young cougars. They wean at about three to four months of age and they disperse from their mothers at around 15 to 18 months. And these dispersals can be quite um, lengthy. There is one record of a cougar that traveled all the way from the Black Hills in South Dakota to the state of Connecticut, where it was hit and killed by a semi-trailer on the highway. So they can move very, very long distances. Their lifespan is, is maybe as, as much as 20 years in captivity, 15 to 20 years. Uh, in the wild, um, 10 to 12 is, is more the norm. They are, I said earlier, the second biggest cat in the Americas, North and South America. The only cat that, that we have um, in the new world that's bigger is of course the jaguar. So do we have a population of cougar in Manitoba? I'm gonna try and answer that question over the next few slides. Now, when you go back historically, Alexander Henry the Elder in 1776 uh, in his journal recorded the fact that he saw the skins of a small number of panthers in um, communities in Southern Manitoba. Ernest Thompson Seton in 1925 uh, wrote that it was generally understood that the Tiger Hills in Southern Manitoba and the Tiger's Head in the Northwest were named after cougars that frequented them. He also enlisted in one of his publications, seven localities in Manitoba where there were records of cougar having been seen or shot. Now, Having said that, it very much appears that cougar largely disappeared from the province uh, in the late 1800s as a result of persecution by the early settlers. They viewed and regarded cougars as a large scary animal and um, would uh, hunt them and shoot them. And it, it appears that for the most part, cougars had pretty much disappeared. So it came as a bit of a surprise in 1973 when a cougar was shot at Stead uh, just uh, short of 100 kilometers northeast of Winnipeg, I think 90 some odd kilometers. And it caught everyone by surprise because we didn't think there were any cougars left in the province. Now, 
that event stimulated a couple of individuals, Bob Brigley and Bob Nero, to put out a call for information on cougar sightings. So this is a copy of one of the advertisements that they had printed up. They had posters printed up that they placed in community centers and, and uh, shopping centers uh, around Manitoba. They um, published it as an advertisement in um, a lot of local newspapers. And as a result, they received a number, quite a large number actually, of firsthand reports of people who claimed to have seen cougar. Now they sifted through those reports and ultimately published a book in 1982 that uh, looked at 436 reports that they believed to be credible. Now, unfortunately, this, this book is now out of print and, and very, very difficult to obtain, but um, it was is perhaps the first book that was written on Cougar in Manitoba. As a result of the book, the wildlife branch hired a um, contract biologist by the name of John Kansas to do some research on cougar in Manitoba. Now his approach was to search forestry roads, recreational trails and secondary routes after fresh snow looking for cougar tracks. And he focused in southeastern Manitoba in Sandylands Provincial Forest and, and other areas around that. He searched 2,411 kilometers in 1995 and found all kinds of tracks except for cougar. None were found. That, if you'll pardon the pun, chilled the interest in cougar in Manitoba by the wildlife branch. And it didn't rekindle an interest in cougar until the animal was shot in, uh, I'm sorry, until recent times when another animal was shot in 2004. Now in 2004, this particular cougar was killed in Grandview, Manitoba. And being the first one since 1973, uh, it rekindled the interest in, in cougars in Manitoba. Because within a month, there was another dead cougar turned into the department. This particular animal that was taken in a trap set for wolves um, near Erickson in December, just about a month later after that other one. So since that time, we have been steadily recording an increasing number of confirmed cougar reports in Manitoba. So cougar reports come in a, in a variety of different ways. So we can have a dead animal that's turned into the department that was either shot or, or uh, taken uh, legitimately by a trapper. Um, we've had pictures. This particular picture was taken in Plum Coulee by um, a farm lady by the name of Mrs. Dick, who was cleaning up the front yard with her husband in the spring when a neighbor came over and said that he saw, thought he saw a large cat go into the clump of bush behind their house. So Mr. Dick and the neighbor went into the bush to chase the animal out. And his last words were to his wife were to stand and take a picture of the animal as it comes out of the bush. And she did. And the animal charged right at her. Uh, she kind of froze up for a second, but then when the animal spotted her, it turned and went past her and she pivoted and took this incredibly marvelous photograph of a cougar running through their yard in Plum Coulee. Now we also have trail camera photos. So um, in October uh, on the east edge of Riding Mountain, we had a series of photographs that were taken of this cougar. And interestingly enough, he returned to the area two more times at about six weeks intervals which was very suggestive that he might have set up a territory in the area, but then he disappeared and he hasn't been photographed again since. So we don't know if he moved on um, or just changed his territory not to include this particular cabin where the trail camera was. We also find tracks. So this is indeed a cougar track that was found in Turtle Mountain Provincial Park um, in November and in December of 2010. So those are the kinds of evidence that we have collected on the presence of cougar in Manitoba. Now, when I get a report or when the department gets a report, what do we do? So there's a number of things. So first and foremost are site investigations. If it is a location that's not too far from the city, I will drive out. Um, I investigated a report in Baudry Provincial Park um, just before New Year's on the 28th of December. And 
if it's a lot farther away, if it's, you know, up at um, Dauphin or, or Swan River someplace, I will contact the local conservation officers and have them investigate. Or very often the people that spotted the cougar call them first if they live in the neighborhood and they, they know uh, that there's a local office that they can have an officer. And then the officer will investigate and send the results of that investigation into me. We will sometimes um, get called out to examine livestock injuries or in some instances, uh, a dead um, animal. This was a horse that was um, believed to have been bitten on the rump by a cougar. But when I investigated, the first thing I noticed was that there are no canine puncture wounds. So it was impossible for a cougar to have made this bite. So this is not a cougar attack. Uh, very clearly because there are no canine puncture wounds. What we ultimately um, figured out was that it got bit by another horse in the paddock with it. And the marks fit the incisors of a horse perfectly. We, uh, we will try to find and photograph um, and take plaster casts of tracks and identify whether or not they're from a cougar. And if we get lucky and we can find either scat, which is uh, the scientific term for poop, uh, or hair, we might be able to get DNA out of it and, and do DNA analysis and confirm that indeed it came from a cougar. So those are the kinds of things we do. And the last thing is that when we have a dead animal turned into us, we do a necropsy. Now I'm, I'm going to give a warning here. Um, I don't know if we have any uh, young people on uh, this webinar. Uh, or people that might be a little bit squeamish, but the next picture I'm about to show is just a little bit gory. So if that's gonna bother you, avert your eyes for a few seconds. So we take dead animals into a vet lab and we do a necropsy on them where we try to determine their general health status uh, and a few other things that I'll talk about in just a minute. Now, the other thing we do whenever we get a report is fill out a cougar occurrence report form. And that's important because very often we can make a determination, um, particularly if there's no physical evidence, we can make a determination from what the witness has to say. So let me give you a couple of examples. Um, I had a truck driver one time who phoned in and said he had a cougar run across the road in front of him. And I asked him to describe the animal and the animal he was describing didn't sound like a cougar to me. It sounded like a lynx. And at the end of his description, I asked him about a tail and he said, no, I didn't see a tail. And I said, well, you know, a cougar has a very long tail and when it runs, it, the, the tail streams out behind it. So perhaps you saw a lynx, which is another cat. And it's quite exciting to see because a lot of people never get to see them. Um, and he was absolutely adamant that he had seen a cougar, but I can tell you uh, there's no way. If he did not see the tail, it was not a cougar, it was, it was a lynx or a bobcat possibly, because we do have those in Manitoba as well. Now, the other thing we do when we have finished investigating, we try to assign um, a classification to the report based on its credibility. So anything that where we have physical evidence, we, we can confirm that that was indeed a cougar. So that's a confirmed report. A probable report is one where there's a realistic description of morphology and behavior by a highly credible or qualified observer, but no physical evidence. A possible is a plausible report with accurate description of behavior and morphology, but with no evidence. And then the next one down is unlikely to have been a cougar because the description of the animal or its behavior suggests something other than a cougar. I'll give you another example. I had a person phone in one time and said that a cougar had slept on the roof of their house in an urban area for four hours one afternoon. Cougar will not do that. I am fairly confident that what the person had on the roof was a raccoon. I have had a raccoon sleeping on my roof in the city of Winnipeg uh, multiple on multiple occasions for hours at a time. So it seems very unlikely to me that that would have been a cougar. And then finally, the category five is not a cougar. We found physical evidence that clearly demonstrates the animal was not a cougar. And that can be tracks or hair, or in some cases, even a photograph. 
I have had um, photographs of Bobcat and Cougar sent to me uh, where the person called it, uh, I'm sorry, Bobcat and Lynx sent to me where the person called it a cougar and clearly it wasn't from the photograph that they took. So what have we learned over the years from studying cougar? I took over the, uh, the, the file on cougar in 2003. So I've been investigating reports for 17 years and I've pulled some other stuff from my predecessor uh, for these next few graphs. First and foremost is the total number of reports we've had. Between 2000 and 2020, we have had over 900 reports of cougar sightings. But now I have to tell you that about half of those, we weren't able to investigate because people would wait a month before they reported. Or we would get a report that said something like, I saw a cougar run across the highway as I was driving home from Falcon Lake. And when I say, whereabouts were you? They'll go somewhere between Falcon Lake and Haddishville. So that's a very big stretch of ground and it's impossible to go out and investigate and look for tracks and, and things of that nature. So easily half of these, there's no way we can do an investigation. Um, the, the other really interesting statistic is that out of all of those, we have only been able to find physical evidence confirming 35. So we know we have had at least 35 confirmed reports. And the interesting thing that I said a little earlier is that when you look at the trend back in 2001, no confirmed reports, 2002, no confirmed reports, 2003, one. Then the next year we had two, then none, then two, then none. And then eventually starting in 2012, we had three confirmed reports and then dropped back to two. And then this year we had five which is the record number of confirmed reports. Now, for those of you that might have a bit of a background in statistics, you can actually fit an interesting curve to that, showing that it is statistically significant and that it is increasing as time goes on. So this is one of the pieces of evidence that I use to suggest that we are seeing a recolonization of cougar in Manitoba. Now, of those 35 confirmed reports, roughly 80% of them occur in this arc that I have drawn on this map. So starting in Turtle Mountain Provincial Park down in the Southwest, swinging over to take in Spruce Woods and then to the Northwest taking in Riding Mountain, Duck Mountain, and then finally the Porcupine Hills on the Saskatchewan border. That is where roughly 80% of our confirmed reports have come from. We've had a smattering in the Interlake and a couple over on the East side but most are in Western Manitoba. And that sort of makes sense because we've got large park areas like Riding Mountain and Duck Mountain that are forested, lots of deer and elk for, um, for prey, for the cougar to feed on, and relatively low human population numbers. So it's a good place for cougar to survive. Now, one of the other things that we look for when we do an acropsy on a cougar is for parasites. And here's why. Way back in, in the early days when I first took over um, the portfolio on, on investigating cougar sites, sightings, a lot of people said, well, any cougar that shows up was, is clearly an escaped animal from a zoo or from somebody that illegally owns one as a pet. So one of the things that you can use to tell the um, whether that's true or not, is whether or not they have parasites. Animals in zoos are treated for parasites. They're dewormed on a regular basis. Anybody that keeps a cougar as a pet, now it is illegal in Manitoba to do that, but there was one case back in uh, about 1986, I believe it was, where we did seize two cougar from a man in um, St. Norbert who illegally possessed them and had bought them in the United States and smuggled them into Manitoba. But uh, for the most part, we don't believe there are any uh, captive cougar that are being held as pets in Manitoba. But in some parts of North America, it is legal. But, but again, I say that people deworm their pets. So when we find parasites, we know that is a wild-born animal that uh, has been raised in the wild. Now, this particular parasite that I'm showing you here is a tapeworm unique to cougar. And its name is Tinea omissa, but uh, the important thing is it's unique to cougar. It's not found in lynx, wolves, 
domestic animals. It's only found in cougar. And the only way an adult cougar can pick it up is by eating, killing and eating the deer that is infected with the intermediate uh, larval form of it. So it has a, a two host um, life cycle in, in deer and then in cougar. Now, the other thing we look at, we've had three dead females over that time period, and we look at the uterus to see if there's placental scarring. Of course, if they have ever carried kittens, the kittens um, leave a scar on the inside of the womb or the uterus. Uh, and if there is no placental scarring, it means the female had never bred. Now, unfortunately, the three dead females we've had in Manitoba showed absolutely no sign that they had ever bred and had kittens. So I've hinted a couple of times, but we've had 10 dead cougar, starting with that first one in December of 1973, uh, coming right up to the uh, recently in 2020, where we had two dead animals in uh, February. And what's interesting about this is when I pop the ages on here, we estimate age, I should say, by uh, two methods. One is by looking at teeth, tooth wear. Uh, and there's a number of charts that are available that um, from captive cougar that that show tooth wear patterns, and you can give a sort of a two year plus or minus estimate of age. And the other way is by measuring something called gum line recession, which gives also a sort of a plus or minus one year of age uh, estimate. So in the beginning, when you look back at the animal that was here in in 1973, and then the first few animals in 2004. Um, they're young. Those animals are likely to be dispersing juveniles or young adults from adjacent populations. Then we move into a period where the animals are older. So these are these are now adults. And um, while adults do move around, it, they're, they're not in that first dispersal phase from their, their home populations. And then when you move into the, the next three, now we've got Older animals, seven to nine years, 10 plus years, 9.5 years. These are, that last one I should say, 9.5 years. We know exactly how old that animal was because it was um, captured in the Cypress Hills in Saskatchewan and it had an ear tag put on it and uh, a radio collar, uh, which unfortunately um, ceased to work because of a dead battery before it got to Manitoba. But it came all the way to Manitoba and it was, it was um, killed in the Duck Mountains in um, a wolf trap. But at any rate, these animals are old, and older. They should be on territory. They're definitely not dispersing juveniles. So the trend is, is from dispersing juveniles through middle-aged animals that should be establishing territories to older animals that would definitely be established on territories. And then this final animal from February, 2020 was under the age of two and well inside Manitoba, which is very suggestive. I'm going to speculate that it was born in Manitoba. It was only 150 kilometers or, or so from the Saskatchewan border. So there is some possibility that it might have been born in Saskatchewan and cross the border and come here. But given that pattern that I've just explained, the, the, the weights are going up, of course, because the ages are going up. But this, this increase in age and then finally this last one, which is a young animal again, um, Another line of evidence that I am using to suggest that we are seeing the recolonization of cougar in Manitoba. Now, I've said that we've had over 900 reports and only 35 were confirmed. So how do we account for so many reports of sightings when so few are actually confirmed? Well, let me give you a case file. In March of 2011, I got a phone call at about quarter to 12 that reported a cougar running across a field uh, north uh, east of Winnipeg. At 12.30, we got another call from an elementary school principal who reported walking down the school because there was a cougar on the playground. So within 15 minutes, we dispatched um, a conservation officer and two biologists to investigate and try to find this animal. And it didn't take long. By about 1.30, the suspect was located and the biologist and conservation officer gave chase. And at 1.45, the suspect was captured. As you can see from the photograph, it's not a cougar. It's a golden retriever. 
So we had an instance where the first caller and then ultimately the principal of the school mistook an animal that was a domestic dog for a cougar. Now it's sort of the right color, but that's all, about all I can say. We get lots and lots of reports that are cases of mistaken identity. I have had wolves and coyotes reported as cougar. I have had lynx and bobcat reported as cougar. I have had pine marten and fisher reported as cougar. That's kind of interesting because um, Fishers, if, if you know what the animal is, it's a, it's a darker animal than a pine marten, and, and many of them tend to be really dark brown or, or even black. Um, when you see them in the wild, they, they, they kind of look cat-like, but we have had a number of instances where fisher have been reported as black panthers. And I know that they were fisher because people captured photographs of them, and in one instance, a video, and uh, the animal in the video was a fisher, but the person interpreted that as a black panther. So I've even had a white-tailed deer in one instance that was reported as a cougar. And when I was um, interviewing the individual who saw it, um, I went into the area where they saw the animal passing through and found deer tracks and nothing but deer tracks. And when I asked exactly what they'd seen, the answer was a tawny colored blob moving through the trees. They did not see a head, they did not see the legs, they did not see the tail, but they just saw something tawny colored moving through the trees. And when I asked why they thought it was a cougar, the answer I got was my neighbor says he saw a cougar last week, it's probably the same one. So the power of suggestion. And then finally, I've mentioned one instance of a, of a raccoon, but we've actually had several instances of raccoons where uh, people have even photographed them and, and sent in the photographs and, and said that reported it basically as a cougar. So this is a case of where I think urbanization and the fact that so many people in society today are so far removed from nature that they have lost the knowledge of wildlife that our grandparents and great-grandparents had. So what I wanna do now is just show you a couple of slides that will help you if you uh, see something that you think might be a cougar, um, help you to make the decision of what it is you're seeing and then report accurately uh, into me or to someone else in the department. So I get a lot of photographs every year of wolf tracks and the rationale goes like this, it's a large track and it has claw marks, so therefore it must be a cougar. But for those of you that own house cats, you probably know that house cats retract their claws. And when they walk, there's no claw marks. Dogs, wolves, coyotes cannot do that. Their toenails are always out there. And when they walk, they leave the impressions of their nails in the mud or the sand or the snow or whatever. Whereas a cougar retracts its claws and when they walk, you don't see claw marks. Uh, maybe if they're you know, sliding down a hill and they're trying to get traction or something, but most often you do not see any claw marks in a cat track, whether it's bobcat, cougar, or even your house cat. Um, there's also differences in terms of toe shape and heel pad and that sort of thing. So, you know, the heel pad, you can see then the cougar, it has three lobes at the back end, whereas uh, the canids only have two. Uh, the toes are uneven. That's kind of an interesting one too. Uh, whereas in the dog family, they're very uniform and very symmetrical. Whereas in cats, they're not. They're almost rotated a little bit. And I've heard one uh, biologist suggest that that's so that they can climb trees better. But I don't know if that's a fact or not. But uh, definitely, they're less symmetrical than dog prints. Now, the other thing is, is size. So this is a bobcat. Now, a lynx would be intermediate, a little bit bigger than a bobcat, but still much smaller than a cougar. So this is a bit of a size comparison. And again, the tail. You notice that the cougar has a very long tail. A uh, bobcat has a much shorter tail, and a lynx has almost no tail at all. So that's uh, another way of um, telling these animals apart in the wild. And you can just see from the size comparison that cougars are actually very large animals. We also get deliberate hoaxes. So I had this picture sent to me three different times. 
once Quay Minute was taken in Steinbeck, once Quay Minute was taken in um, Stonewall, and once Quay Minute was taken in Swan River. It was actually taken in Montana and appeared in a magazine. And then it was scanned into the, uh, and, and placed on a website and it's uh, proliferated all over the internet. And I have talked to biologists in uh, North Dakota and Minnesota who have also received the same picture claiming that it was taken locally. I'm not honestly certain why people feel the need to try to um, pull a hoax like this and, and convince people. Perhaps it's because they reported a cougar and nobody believed them. I, I, I really don't know. But one of the key marks is that when people send in a picture that's a hoax, it's never them that took it. It's a friend of a friend or, you know, a relative of my wife or, you know, something like that. If somebody says, yeah, I took this picture, isn't this cool? That's the first sign that it's probably legitimate. We try to field check uh, photos whenever we can to make sure that um, they're not a hoax. Um, we, we, we fell for one. It was a picture taken at the north end of Riding Mountain and it was a Parks employee and we fell for it. And uh, later we found the same picture um, online that had been taken in Oregon. And it turned out that uh, the, the Parks employee was perhaps uh, slightly disgruntled about something at work and um, um, wanted to get even with, with uh, his boss. I don't know what it was, but at any rate, we've, we've been subject to do a few hoaxes over time. Well, I started out by saying, do we have a population of cougar? So we definitely have cougar here. We've got tracks, dead animals, and other physical evidence. We've had 35 cougar reports confirmed in Manitoba between 2003 and 2021. But we've had little or no evidence of breeding. We've, we've had no photographs of kittens. We've had a couple of tracks that were maybe suggestive, but we couldn't confirm it. We've only had 10 dead animals in 47 years. So this kind of begs the question, do we have a population of cougar? The closest confirmed breeding cougar populations that we know about are in Saskatchewan and of course to the south in the North Dakota Badland. If we don't have a population now, will we someday? So my answer to the first question is maybe. My answer to the second question is absolutely. I believe that we are seeing recolonization now of cougar into Manitoba. And I want to show you um, a couple of uh, graphs, uh, sorry, uh, maps that um, will give you some context of the local area, what's happening around us. So there's a group called the Cougar Network that's online that tracks sightings east of the confirmed known cougar range. So the known cougar range is that great big pink blob there on the west coast of uh, North America that uh, extends um, a little ways into the center, but not all the way across. So all of these different blue dots are, are different sightings that have been reported and confirmed. So they, they only deal in confirmed sightings. So when you look a little bit closer to the area around Manitoba, this is what we have experienced over the past few years. So in 1978, South Dakota declared the cougar an endangered species and enacted protection of the animals. The population did well with protection and grew. And by 1991, animals were being seen to the north in North Dakota and to the south in Nebraska, believed to have been born in the um, western edge of, of South Dakota. Then by 2005 in North Dakota and 2007 in Nebraska, kittens started showing up. So from the time of first cougar being observed to kittens was 14 to 16 years, which, which is an interesting number. Now, to the west of us, in 1997, the first cougar started appearing in the Cypress Hills area on the border of Alberta and Saskatchewan. By 2006, there were clearly kittens and the population had grown to the point where um, there were a number of breeding pairs and, and kittens being born every year. Animals from that population started seeding additional populations in Northern Saskatchewan and eastwards to Moose Mountain Provincial Park, almost on the Manitoba border. 
Now, looking at Manitoba, in 2004, we had our first dead cougar north of Riding Mountain. And the, a year earlier in 2003, we had picked up evidence of a cougar uh, in southern Manitoba. So using that 14 to 16 year rule, 2020, you know, should be the year that we picked up kittens. Unfortunately, we didn't, but I'm pretty convinced that we probably do now have a very small breeding population of cougar in that Western region in Manitoba. Now, I wanna finish by talking about what you should do if you encounter a cougar. Um, they make people nervous and, and that's understandable because they're a large predator and they are certainly capable of doing bodily harm. But we've never had an attack on a person in Manitoba history. And for the most part, uh, cougar do retreat when they encounter a human. The attacks that have been reported in the press to the west of us and to the south of us have all occurred in areas where there are very large numbers of cougar interacting with large numbers of people. So that's a, a, a situation where you can see a cougar attack occur from time to time. But if you do see one, stay calm, don't run, Give the animal room to escape. Most of the reports that I have of people that have seen cougars say that it lasts a second or two and then the animal disappears into the bush uh, running away. If you have small children, pick them up because small children might be prone to run and that could elicit a chase response in the cougar because that's what prey does. Prey runs from them, right? So if they see a small animal running away from them, that could elicit a chase response. So pick the kids up, look and sound threatening, face the cougar and retreat slowly. Keep your eyes on it because cougar are ambush hunters. And if they know they're being watched, the odds of them successfully um, attacking uh, go way down and they're not likely to. So if you let them know that you know they're there, that will in most cases um, short circuit any, any attack behavior. But if an animal does follow you and is aggressive, and if God forbid it attacks, fight back. These, these animals, for the most part, you know, are just a little over 100 pounds, 135, 140 pounds. And there have been many, many, many cases in North America of people successfully fighting off a cougar. So, you know, throw rocks, pick up a stick, hit it. There was a, um, an example in California of a 78-year-old woman whose husband, who was, I think, 82 at the time, was attacked by a cougar, and she pulled out a ballpoint pen from her purse and attacked the cougar, poking it in the face with the pen, and the cougar broke off the attack and ran into uh, the woods. So it's quite possible, uh, although, again, I reiterate, we've never had an attack on a human in Manitoba. Now, most cougar sightings are cases of mistaken identity. Uh, when we've, we've tried to quantify it, um, easily uh, over 80% of sightings where we can actually determine what the animal was, were not a cougar. Cougars do have very large home ranges. And even if a sighting is confirmed, the cougar is likely many kilometers away within a day or two. A cougar in the wild behaving normally is not a threat any more than a coyote, wolf, or black bear. Here in Manitoba, we live with coyotes, wolves, black bear, and in Churchill, we live with polar bear. And um, some of those animals are indeed far scarier than cougar, in my opinion. There has never been an attack by a cougar on a human in Manitoba. Now, I wanna say, if you do see one, first, be thankful because it's really, really rare. And you'll join that elite group of people that have actually seen a cougar in Manitoba. Uh, but if you do see one, I would hope that you would report it because most of what we know about cougar come from investigating reports from the citizens of Manitoba. And you can make those reports either by contacting your local conservation officer or by contacting myself at that uh, phone number, 9458481, or at my email, william.watkins at gov.manitoba.ca. Now I wanna say just one more thing before I finish, and that's um, to talk about obstacles to recolonizing Manitoba. So, so one of the biggest problems that we have, not only in Manitoba, but elsewhere in um, Eastern North America where cougars are recolonizing at the present is fear and persecution by humans. So 
um, most often people are very nervous. And I think most often when people think there's a cougar in the area, um, they respond with um, this anxiety because they don't know enough about cougar biology and cougar behavior. And what I've been doing over the years is trying to do a number of talks in local communities and, and webinars like this so that we can get more information out there so people will feel less anxious about it. But um, we've had a couple of animals that have been shot in Manitoba over that 20 year period. And um, I'm kind of uh, hoping that we'll, we'll be able to see kittens and a breeding population in Manitoba in the not too distant future. So with that, I uh, would like to thank a few people like Dr. Charlene Brickfins at the zoo and Dr. Stefan Peterson, who have participated in most of the necropsies that we've done. Uh, my colleagues in Manitoba Conservation, the Manitoba Museum, Brandon University, University of Manitoba, and the people of Manitoba who have reported their observations and their photographs. So with that, I'll turn it back to Lindsay for questions. And Lindsay, I'm gonna stop sharing. Is that what you would like me to do? Sure, that would be great. Okay. All right, well, thank you so much, Bill. That was fantastic. Um, there's been a lot of great questions and comments uh, coming through. Uh, I've tried to compile them all into a list here. So um, we'll just start going through them in the order that they started arriving. Uh, so the first question came in from Alyssa. She would like to know, is there a particular time during the year in Manitoba when these sightings are more active? Uh, so for example, in the summer or in the winter time? That's, that's an excellent question. And we have looked at the timing of when most of the reports come in. And it, it's as you might expect, we get most reports when there are the most people recreating in the out of doors. So we tend to see most of our reports in summer when people are out camping, hiking, canoeing, fishing. Uh, and then we also get a lot of reports in the fall when people are out hunting. But in the depths of winter, in the sort of January, February period, we get almost no reports. And uh, I guess the people that are out then are a few cross country skiers, but there's not nearly as many of them as there are in the summertime or in the fall. So the vast majority of our reports come in that period, the summer and, and the fall. All right, our next question. Uh, I apologize if I mispronounce your name uh, from T Vault. Uh, based on 35 confirmed sightings, can you do an estimate about how many cougars may live in Manitoba? Um, it would be at best uh, a guess and wow what what's happened there I'm getting a real loud buzzing noise oh. I don't hear a buzzing oh. Bill you're muted right now Are you? We're dead. Oh, I can hear you. We can hear you OK, Bill. Uh, OK, I just had this the, um, huge siren type noise that, that oh. came over the system and drowned me out completely. <laughs> OK, but you can hear me now. I can hear you, yeah. OK. Um, and what was the question again? <laughs> the question was, you got to love technology, right? Oh, I don't know what that noise was. I've never had anything like that. All right. The question was, based on 35 confirmed sightings, can you do an estimate about how many cougars may live in Manitoba? Ah, yes. It, it, it's entirely speculative, but I, I would guesstimate that we might have um, no more than a dozen. And, and I think that we've probably got a, a few breeding pairs, you know, in the uh, Duck Mountains and maybe in the Porcupine Hills. Um, we have had an animal that was uh, maybe down in the Sandy Lands that I got several reports, but none of them we were able to confirm. But if, if we had been able to, it kind of looked like a, a, a territory had been set up for a while. But 
it, it's purely speculative, but we, we do know there's very few animals. And one of the ways we know there's very few animals is from roadkill statistics from North Dakota and Florida. So in North Dakota, which has an estimated population of only something like 200 cougar, they get a dozen or more cougar a year killed on the highways, usually kittens or juveniles that are hit by cars. In Florida, the number is even higher. Of course, Florida has way more people and way more super highways and freeways. And the, having driven there, I can I can say that the, the it's a little bit crazy sometimes on the on the freeways. And they'll you know they'll have 20 animals a year killed on the highway. So we haven't seen any dead animals on our highways. If we had a couple hundred cougar, I would expect we would be seeing some road killed animals. And since we haven't, I'm of the opinion that our population levels are probably very low. And as I say, maybe a dozen at most. All right, uh, our next question is from John. He'd like to know, uh, would the increase in sightings of cougars in Manitoba uh, be as a result of them being pushed out of other areas? Um, so more sightings here, but less sightings uh, in other areas where they used to be. No, generally it's just the opposite. It's animals that come from an area where cougars are at their sort of maximum uh, carrying capacity and the young have to move on to establish territories of their own. So we see, for example, from North Dakota, uh, young animals dispersing northward and we see from Saskatchewan, uh, young animals dispersing eastward because their home territories are pretty much all filled with older animals that drive them out. All right, our next question is from Vera Lynn. Uh, what happened to the two cougars that were removed from the home in St. Norbert? Were they put in the zoo, uh, rehabilitated or returned to the wild? They were put in a zoo. They had been, um, taken into captivity as kittens and they couldn't be rehabilitated and put in the wild because they had absolutely no hunting skills or, or no ability to uh, uh, to survive by taking prey. So they actually were sent to the zoo in Saskatoon. All right, and our next question is from Helen. Uh, how credible would you consider reports of cougar sightings along the Seine River in the middle of St. Vitel two or three summers ago? We categorized those as not likely. And we did that for a couple of reasons. There were some photographs that were sent in to us that were clearly house cats. And some of the other evidence that was presented to us in, in terms of track photos and things like that were not cougar. So it's, it's impossible to rule it out completely, but uh, we felt that um, based on the evidence, it was unlikely that there had been a cougar along the Seine. All right, Tom would like to know, uh, what, are, what are the sexes of your confirmed reports? Uh, he's located in Florida where the panther biologists want the population to disperse from Southwest Florida, uh, where there's approximately 120 to 230 panthers. Uh, the females are especially unwilling to disperse uh, it's mostly young males that disperse north through Florida. We, we don't know the sex of a lot of our confirmed cougars because it's not always possible to tell from a photograph. Um, we do know from our, our 10 dead animals that we had seven males and three females. Um, there's a couple of other photographs that we suspect are, are, uh, are females based on the fact that they're more graceful and, and um, slimmer than a a male. Males tend to be more muscled and, and chunkier looking, but there's there's a large number of them we just can't tell the sex. And we do often send those pictures to, uh, I've got a friend that that is on the Florida Panther recovery team, and I send him pictures and say, can you tell what sex this animal is? And and most of the time he's he emails me back and says, no, nah, sorry, we just can't tell from this photograph. If you think about it, a lot of trail cam photos are taken at night and they're kind of grainy. And so we just can't tell. But we do know from the 10 dead ones that we've had that seven were male and three were female. All right, Jocelyn would like to know, uh, what is the relationship with cougars and wolves? Since they hunt the same prey and have overlapping territory, are they aggressive towards one another or do they live peacefully alongside each other? No, they're aggressive towards one another. 
And um, I, I think uh, a lone cougar with a pack of wolves, uh, the pack of wolves will put the run on the cougar and chase it off of a kill and, and drive it away. Uh, on the other hand, a lone wolf versus a lone cougar, it kind of tips the other way. And the cougar can win that encounter. Uh, there have been cases in the literature of wolves being killed by cougar and also cases of cougar being killed by wolves. So it kind of depends. If the, if the wolf brings friends, he wins. <laughs> All right, Dan would like to know, of the 10 cougar carcasses analyzed, are there any DNA profile similarities between the older cougar samples and the more recent samples? Well, what I'll, what I'll begin by saying is that we, we don't have our results back on the last couple of animals, but the animals that we do have DNA results for, it's kind of interesting because the animals that, that were killed north of Riding Mountain, the DNA matches up with the DNA of cats in Saskatchewan and Alberta. And the animals that were killed south of Riding Mountain, the DNA matches up with DNA of cougars in North Dakota and then uh, South Dakota, and of course, further west into Montana, Wyoming, that, that sort of country. So we do know that we've got animals coming in from both the west and the south. We had one animal where the DNA was, um, was kind of interesting in that it had some characteristics of both Saskatchewan and North Dakota, which led us to think that maybe it was the result of a, um, a Saskatchewan animal meeting up with a North Dakota animal and you know having young. Um, but it, it, that's entirely speculative and we only have the one case. So we, we kind of like to think that, you know, we're the meeting ground of, of uh, cougars from both of these areas. But in terms of, you know, the, the 1973 cougar, I, I'm really curious about that one, where it might have come from. And we don't have a DNA sample because the biologist at the time, well, back in 1973, DNA sampling wasn't common. It was very expensive and, and um, wasn't very reliable. Uh, the, the hide was tanned, the skull and, and skeleton were prepared and are in the museum. Um, but in order to try to get DNA out of the skeletal remains, it's, it's a destructive process. You have to, you know, take some bones and grind them up sort of thing and then hope you get DNA. And the museum doesn't particularly want that to happen. Uh, so we, we don't know anything about that animal really where it might have come from. But as I say, the, the animals that um, we have DNA results from in the modern period in the last 20 years are coming from both Saskatchewan and North Dakota. All right, uh, Vera Lynn would like to know, are cougars protected by law in Manitoba? Uh, and if not, how come? Uh, they, if yes, uh, could you please describe what this entails? Uh, describe what, what entails? Uh, the protection of cougars. Oh, in Manitoba, if okay. They are. Yes, cougars are protected in Manitoba, and they've been protected since 1973. After that cougar was killed instead, the wildlife branch, within two weeks, had uh, the government put out a regulation saying it was illegal to kill a cougar, um, and they've been protected ever since. So currently, under the Wildlife Act, there's a, a list of animals known as Division Six, which are all the protected species, and it's on there. So you cannot shoot a cougar except in defense of life. So if a cougar is attacking you, yes, you may defend yourself and you may kill a cougar. But if you have problems with livestock or something like that, the appropriate approach is to contact our conservation officers who will deal with the problem and they may deal with the problem by live trapping the animal and moving it away, or they may, depending on the circumstances, deal with the problem by actually setting out uh, traps to try to kill the animal. But we've never had that circumstance arise in Manitoba. We have had the occasional incident of a cougar killing livestock, but it seems to be one-off incidents where they don't repeat it and then they move on elsewhere in the range. So we've, we've never had the occasion to have to kill a cougar or move a cougar because of it. But yes, they are protected. And the only legitimate reason for killing a cougar in Manitoba would be to uh, protect your own life or the life of uh, someone in your family or that you're with. All right, uh, Anne would like to know, what is the current status of cougars in Manitoba? Are they endangered, extinct or extirpated? Well, 
none of the above. Uh, we do not list them under our Endangered Species Act because we have insufficient um, evidence. So we have a very strict set of criteria for listing species as endangered or threatened or special concern. And they don't meet any of those criteria because we have so little information. So the status of them is a protected species under the Wildlife Act, not under the Endangered Species Act. And that protection they have under the Wildlife Act is roughly the equivalent of being listed as endangered under the Endangered Species Act. All right, uh, T-Bolt would like to know, uh, should we look at cougars in the eyes? I learned that felines feel threatened if we look at them in the eye. Is that true with cougars as well? Um, I, I, I think I, I have to say it's very unlikely you'd ever get close enough to look one in the eye. But what I have said earlier is that uh, you should look at them and, and make them aware that you know they're there. And that you do that because it, uh, it short circuits their attack response. They don't like a fight and they would rather surprise their prey by you know approaching from behind or something like that. So if they know you're looking at them, they tend not to attack. So, um, yeah, I, I, I can't think of any instances where someone was close enough to actually sort of look them in the eye. I'm, I'm not sure what that would do. All right, uh, Michael would like to know, is it illegal to shoot or trap cougars in Manitoba? Well, it's illegal to shoot them um, unless you're defending yourself. And we have actually laid charges against one individual for doing just that. And uh, the individual was convicted in court and paid a fine. Um, trapping? Under, under Manitoba law, it is acceptable for a trapper to occasionally catch what we refer to as a bycatch or um, you know, a non-target animal uh, because you can't necessarily control what's gonna wander into your trap. So we have had uh, a number of cougars that have been accidentally taken by trappers in sets for wolves and coyotes. And that is legal in the sense that, that uh, they haven't done anything wrong and we don't charge them, but we don't allow them to keep it. So they're required by law, if they catch a cougar accidentally, to report to us, and then our officers will come and pick up the animal and bring it into me in Winnipeg for scientific study, for necropsy and, and that sort of thing. Now, what we have done in the past, too, uh, is recognizing that most people are, get quite excited about a cougar, and, and um, we have allowed the hide to go back to regional local museums to be stuffed and mounted so that they can display it in their museum. So, you know, we have sent hides back to the visitor center at Riding Mountain and in uh, Russell and Boise Vane and in a whole bunch of, uh, not Boise Vane, anyway, a whole bunch of different communities now have mounted cougars in their museum because they were taken by a trapper in the local vicinity and we've allowed them to, to have the hide uh, to display so that people can learn more about cougar and know that cougar do exist in their area. All right, Sandra would like to know, uh, do cougars roam around certain areas more than others, such as along rivers, uh, or would they cross a field? Uh, well, th they'll do both. Now, from radio callers on animals, particularly GPS callers, which uh, link up with the satellite so that these animals can be tracked continuously, we know that cougars will cross agricultural fields, they will cross highways, they will cross open areas, they will cross through communities, but mostly at night. There was a radio caller cougar in Saskatchewan that uh, was in a, a fairly urbanized area with a lot of open terrain that went into a junkyard and hid out underneath a wrecked car all day. And then when it got dark, came out and continued on its journey. So they will cross those areas, but they prefer wooded areas. So areas along creeks, rivers, uh, lake shores that we call riparian areas, which have a lot of trees, that's where they will tend to move through. Um, or contiguous bush, any, any area where you've got, you know, a, a large area of bush, they'll move through that in preference, but they will cross open fields at night. 
and they do so quickly. We, we also know from our radio caller studies that when they do that, they tend to move, they, they book it. They don't only gag, they, you know, they're, they're get across it as fast as they can and in the cover. All right, Stacy would like to know, what other types of animal sightings should be reported to Manitoba Conservation, uh, such as wolves or lynx or any others? Hmm. Um, I, I would say that our, um, our biologists are, are interested in receiving sightings of things like bobcats and um, wolves if it's kind of like an extraterritorial kind of thing. So, I mean, if you're seeing a wolf up near Thompson, that's, we know there's wolves there. But if you're seeing a wolf in, in the Pembina Valley, that would be of great interest to us. So if you're seeing them out of their sort of normal range, yeah, we, we want to know. Uh, wolverines are kind of interesting. Now, I'm going to talk about an animal that some of you may not know much about, but there's a, an animal called a gray fox, which occasionally comes into the province on the east side in the white shell um, and south to the American border. And we're quite interested in getting reports of those. The odd one gets killed by a trapper in, in, in a set for a regular fox, a red fox or something. But uh, this is an animal that is um, may also be re uh, colonizing Manitoba. I'm not sure that it was ever here before, but uh, it's something of interest. So things of that nature, anything that's outside of its normal range or anything that is new, like we got a report back in the summer of an opossum in southwestern Manitoba. First known record. And that is quite interesting. We think that may be a result of climate change. Uh, the fact that we're getting warmer and warmer and warmer and it's allowing these animals to move north. There are a number of records in North Dakota, but that was the first for Manitoba. So anything out of the ordinary, we wanna hear about. All right. Uh, Catherine would like to know if there have been any confirmed sightings in the RM of Gimli? Yes. Uh, now, depending how far you go, there, there's at least one that's not all that far from Gimli to the west. Okay. Uh, and John would like to know, are cougars hunted by any other animals or are they the top of the food chain? Hmm. Well, as I said earlier, they, they have been known to be killed by wolves. Um, they'll be chased off of a kill by a bear as well, but it's, it's really rare because bears are kind of, you know, slow and lumbering and they're, they're, the cougar's going to get away from a bear, no problem. But um, they, they kind of, they share that top of the food chain with, with wolves, I think, and um, can be, as I say, occasionally killed by wolves. All right, Paul would like to know, uh, could you tell us what are the legalities of shooting cougars in Manitoba? He lives on the southern boundary of Riding Mountain National Park and did see a cougar 12 years ago, confirmed by its long tail and sub subsequent sightings from park staff. Neighbors have reported sightings over the years uh, and attitudes in the area are to shoot on sight and he has been trying to discourage that behavior. Yeah, shooting on site is illegal. So uh, if, you're, if you have concerns about your livestock, the appropriate response is to contact our officers and let them deal with the situation. Um, if you shoot a cougar and we learn about it, we will do an investigation. And if it turns out that it was shot on site for no good reason other than it was a cougar, we will lay charges and we will uh, take it to court. All right, Colleen would like to know, has Manitoba Conservation introduced any cougars into parts of Manitoba? No, we have not. Um, it's, it's funny because that's a rumor that we hear frequently and, and people ask us about that. Uh, at least once or twice a year, I get asked that same question. And no, um, we have never introduced or even translocated cougars from one part of Manitoba to another. Uh, it, it, it wouldn't necessarily be successful because cougars are large animals that can move vast distances. So if we were trying to, to establish a cougar population somewhere, there's no way we could make sure they'd stay there. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's kind of a zero sum game and, and it would 
be incredibly expensive and we've never ever attempted it and nor would we ever. All right, T-Ball has another question. Uh, how far east do you think cougars have spread in the province? You mentioned Sandy Lands at one point, but do you think some could be further east? Uh, there have been confirmed cougar reports from northwestern Ontario between the border and Kenora. So yes, we, we do know. We, we've got a, at least one confirmation from Hongo Water um, in eastern Manitoba. And uh, there's a couple of confirmations, as I say, between the border and Kenora. Um, so yeah, they're, they, they can and have moved all the way through Manitoba and into Ontario. There was a, a, a trail cam video shot of a cougar just outside of Thunder Bay last week. So we know they're, they're in Northwestern Ontario as well. All right. Uh, Catherine would like to know, uh, when cougars kill their prey, do they put them in a tree? She has heard this, but not sure if it's accurate. Yeah, it's, it's not, it's not accurate. For the most part, what happens when a cougar kills an animal, um, like a deer? So they will drag it into cover, but not up a tree. So they'll, if, if it's killed out in the open and there's a, a clump of bush nearby, you know, let's, let's say within 40 or 50 meters, they will drag that animal into cover. Uh, what they then tend to do is very quickly uh, open the animal up and eat the liver and the heart and the, the lungs and, and all the, those good bits. And then they'll, they'll wander off, um, but stay close. So, you know, they'll be two or 300 meters away, hiding in the bush, having a nap, you know, after that great big feast. And then after a few hours, they'll come back and start eating on the carcass, the, the meat and, and some of the other tissue. But that, that seems to be um, very typical of cougar that they'll, they'll drag an animal into cover and then feast on the, uh, the inner organs before um, tackling any of the other rest of the animal. But no, pulling it up a tree, almost unheard of. All right. Um, since Manitoba uh, likely has low cougar populations, what is the risk of inbreeding within these small populations if breeding is occurring in the province? Is there enough movement of cougar from outside Manitoba into the province to prevent this? And that was a question from Lizzie. Yeah, I think that the, the fact that we have cougar entering the province from North Dakota and entering the province from Saskatchewan is, is probably a good thing because it will bring together two fairly different and, and um, uh, separate uh, genomes. So that should alleviate concerns about inbreeding. But definitely, if they were cut off from those sources of animals, like the, the cougar in Florida, they had to introduce cougar from Texas to reduce inbreeding and alleviate some of the inbreeding depression that they saw in that population. But um, since we, we haven't even demonstrated that there's a breeding population in Manitoba yet, we just, we just don't know whether or not there could be any problems. But I think it unlikely because we have cougar coming from two different populations. Okay, uh, do cougars make any identifying sounds? Well, this is a good one. Now, I frequently have recordings of strange animal calls sent into me uh, by people who think it's a cougar. And the most common animal that is recorded and, and the, the sound sent to me is a red fox. And red fox makes some really surprising noises. There's a vixen call and there's an alarm call and, and a number of other calls that are, are sort of, you know, like shrieks in the night that um, if people have never heard them before, it, it <laughs> yeah, it could be frightening, I guess. But uh, in terms of, of cougar calls, cougar tend to be very quiet animals. And some of the noises they make are highly unusual. So a female in communicating with her kittens makes these little chirping noises that almost sound bird-like rather than cat-like. And she keeps that up to you know, keep the kittens and communicate with them uh, when they're moving through the, the woods and that. Uh, there is a kind of a caterwaul sound that females make when they're in heat that is kind of like, uh, if you can imagine the female house cat in heat caterwauling, it's like that only way louder and way deeper. So the, the pitch is lower and, and it's louder, but it sounds almost exactly the same as a female house cat in heat. Um, males will snarl and, and scream at one another when they're fighting. Uh, but again, for the most part, 
cougars are relatively silent. They don't call a lot, except when they're looking for a mate or um, when they're fighting. All right. Uh, have there been any actual confirmed reports of cougars sighted around Winnipeg? Um, within the city limits, no. I think the closest is is that Plum Coulee one that I showed you the picture during my presentation. Um, yeah, that would be the closest one to Winnipeg. We've never had a confirmed report inside or on the edge of Winnipeg. Okay. Um, we have had reports, but not confirmed reports. Okay. Uh, Will would like to know what kind or type of terrain are we most likely to see a cougar in? Well, that's that's a tricky question because um, most of the cougar reports that we get are uh, that, that we are able to confirm are near highways because that's where people are, right? So, you know, people travel on highways and, and there's a bit of a, a bias there because we, we're not getting people reporting them from way back in the bush with the exception of the occasional um, trail camera photo. But uh, cougars like rugged terrain with lots of forest cover. And that's the kind of terrain where you could walk past a cougar and not even know it's there. If it's it's laying behind a log somewhere, you know, watching you, um, you could walk right by it and never know it's there. So most often they're sighted in more open terrain or near routes of travel. But in actual fact, they prefer a more rugged terrain with more cover. Okay, uh, question from Sandra. Uh, do cougars rest up in trees during the daytime? Um, they, they have been known to sleep in trees uh, on occasion, but um, they can be treed and that's the way biologists often uh, are able to put radio collars on them. They're, they're chased by hounds and they go up a tree for, for defense and then they're darted and you know caught in a net as they fall out of the tree and then a radio collar is affixed. But I think, um, yes, they will do that, but it's not that common. I think they prefer to hide in cover when they're, when they're up in a tree, they can be spotted. So uh, I think they prefer to hide in, in cover somewhere rather than to go up a tree, but they have been known to do that. Okay, we're getting to the end here. Uh, question from Teobald again. Uh, having more cougars in Manitoba, what does that mean about the health of the species? What would it take for them to expand throughout the province? Well, I'm not sure they would expand throughout the province because certainly in, in agricultural Manitoba, there isn't that much terrain for them to live in and they would be in constant conflict with humans. But certainly um, there's there's large areas in the West in all those big parks that I mentioned and um, other areas in between the parks where they can and probably are living right now. Um, there are some areas in the East, of course, where they, they could live as well. We've had a number of reports from the white shell, but unfortunately none that we've been able to confirm. Um, but those areas certainly can support cougar populations, but I don't think we would ever see a cougar population you know, sort, sort of in and around central Manitoba, you know, between Winnipeg and Portage or between Winnipeg and Selkirk and that. Uh, it's just not suitable for a cougar. All right. Well, we have one last question, um, but before we get to that, uh, Bill, there's been a lot of uh, questions about what's the difference between uh, cougar lynx and bobcat tracks. And I'm just gonna try to share my screen here uh, because I was able to find uh, just an example of, um, of the different types of tracks. So let's see. Are, you able to see the PowerPoint picture with the tracks? I've tried sharing my screen. Okay, I'm not seeing it. No, okay. Hold on. Are you seeing my screen at all? Um, no. But, I, but I, I can speak to it even without seeing a picture. Okay. So I, I showed earlier a, a, a drawing of a cougar track. Now, lynx being another large cat have many of the same features, 
but the primary difference is, is that lynx have furry feet to, to, to say the least. So they're, they're well adapted to life in the boreal forest to walking in, in snow when they're, you know, their, their feet are almost like miniature snowshoes. So when you see a lynx track, there's often this blurred out area all around it from where the fur on their feet leaves an impression in the snow or the mud. So it's not a clear track like a cougar track. You, you'll see the central area with the toes and the, the heel pad, but then all around it, you'll see this halo of smeared out area that's from the, the hair on their feet. The other thing that's interesting is that you often see um, an area where, where they'll, they'll crouch and the part of the leg touches down in the snow. And the only way to describe it is it looks like an ice cream cone. So you get this little, a straight area with a round thing on the end of it with, as I said, all this fluffy stuff around the edge where their fur um, blurs out the track. And the only way to describe it is to me, it looks like a, a, a silhouette of an ice cream cone. And whenever you see that, you know, it's a lynx. Bobcat are much, much smaller. So um, um, if you see, you know, they're maybe a little bit bigger than a fox track, but uh, there's just no confusion between a bobcat and a cougar because they're so much smaller. Lynx and, and cougar overlap, wolves and cougar overlap in size, but bobcat are way smaller. All right, so for anybody who was wanting to see um, a visual of cougar, coyote, and bobcat tracks, um, I just included a link in the chat box uh, to the Department of Michigan's DNR, uh, and that shows a really good example of cougar, coyote, and bobcat tracks um, as well as comparison between canine and feline tracks. So you can click on that link later on. Uh, it'll take you to that site just for a visual comparison. Uh, Bill, the one last question that we had uh, that a lot of people have also asked before we finish off tonight is, have you been lucky enough to see a cougar live in the wild yourself? <laughs> no, <laughs> uh, all the cougars I've seen and worked on are dead, which is really unfortunate. So, I mean, I've been the person who has uh, organized and, and conducted the necropsy on nine of those dead animals. Of course, the, the animal in 1973, I was still in high school, so uh, I had nothing to do with that one. But uh, all of the nine since, um, I have uh, necropsied. And so, yeah, I got a lot of experience with dead cougars, but I've unfortunately never seen a live one in the wild. And I, I really hope that I do. Uh, before I end up retiring, I would really love to see a cougar and even better yet, maybe a, a female cougar with kittens. That would um, just be icing on, on the cake for my career, I think. All right. Well, thank you so much, Bill, um, on behalf of myself and uh, all the very many participants that we had join us this evening. Uh, we hope that you all enjoyed Bill's presentation and learning more about our cougars in Manitoba. Uh, and how you can report your cougar sightings to Manitoba Conservation if you are lucky enough to come across one or if you think you may have found some evidence of one. Um, we do have uh, upcoming webinars that can be found on manitobaparks.com or by following us on Facebook and Twitter through at uh, mbgovparks. Uh, we do encourage you to come out and visit us in Manitoba Parks this winter. If you do, please come out just with the members of your household and remember to practice social distancing. Uh, again, thank you so much, Bill, for the wonderful presentation tonight. And uh, we hope everyone has a great evening. It was a pleasure. Um, again, I'd just like to thank everyone for taking time out of their busy schedule to, to attend and learn about Cougar. Um, I never mentioned it earlier, but I hope people notice the Cougar over my left shoulder there that's been watching everything. It's just a poster, but uh, it makes me feel good. All right. Thanks so much. Everyone have a great evening. Good night, all.